All right, everybody. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, tonight, we're diving into yet another sutta. Uh, we're still going to be in the middle length discourses, the Majima Nikaya. Tonight, we're going to be looking at sutta number 54, the Patalya Sutta the sutta or the teaching to the householder named Potalia. So, um, as you know, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, we entered a new section of the middle length discourses, mm. and it's a bunch of different little suttas, all, well, they're all two householders. But tonight's an interesting one when it comes to the idea of a householder. <clears throat> so um, uh, let, let's just go ahead and dive in. Um, I'm going to read just the beginning. So just to get us kind of like acquainted with the characters of this sutta. Uh, but then I want to pause because we need to have a, a little talk about this guy, Patalia. So again, <clears throat> excuse me. So, so this is the Patalya Sutta, and it goes like this. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the country of Anguttarapans, where there was a town named <clears throat> Apana. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went into Apana for alms. When he had wandered for alms in Apana, he had returned from his alms round. After his meal, he went to a certain grove for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the foot of a tree. Patalia the householder, while walking and wandering for exercise, wearing full dress with parasols and sandals, also went to the grove. And having entered the grove, he went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood to one side. The Buddha, the Blessed One, said to him, There are seats, householder. Sit down if you like. When this was said, the householder Patalya thought, the recluse Gotama addresses me as a gahapati, as a householder, and angry and displeased, he remained silent. A second time, the Blessed One said to him, there are seats, gahapati, there are seats, householder, sit down if you like. And a second time, the householder Patalya thought, the recluse Gotama addresses me as a householder. And angry and displeased, he remained silent. A third time, the Blessed One said to him, there are seats, householder, sit down if you like. When this was said, the householder Patalya thought, the recluse Gotama addresses me as a householder. And angry, and displeased, he said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, it's neither fitting nor proper that you address me as a gahapati, as a householder. And the Buddha says, Householder, that's right, it's so funny. He says, Householder, you have the namita. You have the characteristics or the aspects and marks and signs of a householder. Patalya replies, nevertheless, nevertheless, Master Gotama, I've given up all my works and cut off all my affairs. <clears throat> In what way, householder, have you given up all your works and cut off all your affairs? Master Gotama, I've given up all my wealth, 
all my grain, my silver, and I've given all of my gold to my children as their inheritance. I do not advise or blame them about such matters, but merely live on food and clothing. That's how I have given up all my works and cut off all my affairs. Householder. The cutting off of affairs as you describe it is one thing. But in the noble one's discipline, the cutting off of affairs is different. <clears throat> Okay, so let's pause there because I want to give you a little backstory on, on this uh, Hotalia guy. So just a little quick background on this because this is, this is really interesting what's kind of going on here. So um, actually, let me, I'll, I'll share it to you. I'll share it this way. Um, when I was a undergraduate student, not even in graduate school, but when I was an undergraduate, I took a course on Hinduism. And, you know, the first thing you learn in a class on Hinduism, if it's a good class on Hinduism, the first thing you learn is that there's no such thing as Hinduism. I'll put it to you that way. Um, that, that's what I was taught the first day. And basically the idea is, is that the religion of India is far more complicated and diverse than one thing called Hinduism. Let's just put it that way. Nonetheless, there is sort of, you know, cultural trends, let's put it that way, that are kind of common to India, put it that way. So there's one kind of um, outlook on life that is kind of, again, it's sort of a, it's an older view, but it's still common in the world. And what this is called is called actually ashram. <laughs> now, I know that you probably know the word ashram as a place. And indeed, that word ashram is like a, a retreat center, if you will. <clears throat> but the word ashram it means uh no no shram <laughs> and shram is to sweat to toil to labor to work so ashram is not working not laboring now if you are going to do that ash that that not meaning not work <laughs> You could go to a place where they support that, and that's called an ashram in that sense. But the term ashram means, or it refers to, it, it means without toil, but it refers often to what are called the four stages of life. And in India, for men, and I want to clarify that, <clears throat> there are these four stages of life, traditionally, and it goes from birth to age 25. So for the first 25 years of your life, it's about brahmacharya. But that term, brahmacharya, is usually just glossed or translated as the life of a student. So you're a student for the first 25 of your years of your life. <clears throat> and then you get married. And from 25 to 50, you're a gahapati. You're, it's called a grihastaha. House, you're a householder. You have a job. You, have, you raise a family. You uh, support yourself. You support your family. You have the affairs of the world. But then when you're 50, you can retire and you can go into a stage of life. Remember, these are four stages. So the student, the householder, and then what is called the retiree. This is a uh, vanaprastaha. But this idea of just re being retired, that's what our uh, Hotalia described. It's when you give everything to your children and 
you are now sort of free to basically kind of maybe, you know, study, do meditation, cultivate spirituality. And by the way, in when you were a householder, your dharma, your duty, your responsibility here was to be a householder. But then when you're 50, your duty is to now start cultivating your spirituality, and that's where you retire. And then from age 75, so for 25 years, you can be a retiree. And then from 75 on, you are a sannyasin, a, a renunciant. And that's when you like actually start even going deeper into the forest, doing even deeper meditation, and basically like really preparing for death in that kind of way. So those are the four stages in a traditional kind of Hindu or Indian view of life. And I want you to know that that is sort of, um, well, I guess what I want to say is, is that when I was an undergraduate student, I learned that that was sort of a part of Indian culture. And lo and behold, here you have it appearing in a very old Buddhist sutta, sort of attesting to this kind of way of life. Now, what I want you to notice, of course, and I think everybody out there noticed, is the kind of the humor where the Buddha keeps calling him a householder, even though he's insisting, I'm not a householder, though. And that's, of course, a very funny thing, right? It's this idea of like, no, I've given away all my wealth to my children so that they can take care of me. So the Buddha is kind of calling out this guy on not really renouncing in that sense and not really, um, well, not really cutting off all his affairs in that way. So any questions about that, about the 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 background of this sutta? Be okay with that? Cool. So that's the background. <clears throat> Once again, Once again, the Buddha says here, so you giving up all your 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 wealth to your kids and all of that, the Buddha says, yeah, the cutting off of affairs as you describe it, <laughs> that's one thing. But in the Arya, the practice of the Aryas or the discipline of the noble ones, the cutting off of affairs is is different. And Putalya wants to know, <clears throat> what is the cutting off of affairs like in the noble one's discipline, venerable sir? It would be good, venerable sir, if the blessed one would teach me the Dharma, showing me what the cutting off of affairs is like in the noble one's discipline. Then listen, householder, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, Putalya the householder replied. And the Blessed One said this. <clears throat> so, this is teaching number one of the Sutta. <clears throat> Householder, there are these eight things in the Noble One's discipline that lead to the cutting off of affairs. What are the eight? With the support of the non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is abandoned. With the support of not taking what has not been given, the taking of what has not been given is abandoned. With the support of truthful speech, false speech is to be abandoned. With the support of unmalicious speech, Malicious speech is to be abandoned. With the support of no rapacity and greed, rapacity and greed are to be abandoned. With the support of having no spite and no scolding, 
spite and scolding are to be abandoned. With the support of no anger and irritation, anger and irritation are to be abandoned. With the support of non-arrogance, arrogance is to be abandoned. These are the eight things stated in brief without being expounded in detail, which lead to the cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline. So before we get the detailed explanation of this, I just want us to notice that this is a very particular list of eight things. <laughs> and, you know, there's always sort of this, um, you know, if you ever go looking up the precepts in Buddhism, you'll find like, sometimes there's a list of five precepts. Sometimes there's a list of 10 precepts. Sometimes there's a list of eight precepts. And a certain kind of mind is dissatisfied with that <laughs> and would like to know, no, just what's the list. And that's where I kind of want to remind everybody that you know, the way that I read suttas is I really think every sutta needs to be read as its own teaching in that way. In other words, these are the eight things for potalia. Now, we might be able to get something out of this, and I, I think we can get something out of this. But that's where I think we always should read suttas as like upaya in that way where we are witnessing the Buddha teach this person the Dharma. And we can take things away from that. But we need to remember that the Buddha isn't directing it to us in that way. So, so the, again, these are a very interesting list of eight precepts in that way. Nothing surprising. I don't think anything in that list should be a surprise to anybody. Some of them seem a little maybe redundant, but I actually think that there's nuances to each of those. I'm going to save any kind of detailed explanation till the next section, because that's where it's going to go. But I just wanted to address this particular list of eight. And just to mention, yep, yeah, this is for Potalia in that way. All right. So Potalia is interested. He's been intrigued. And so he says, Venerable Sir, it would be good if, out of compassion, the Blessed One would expound to me in detail these eight things that lead to the cutting off of affairs in the Noble One's discipline, which have been stated already in brief by the Blessed One without being expounded in detail. Then listen up, householder and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, Patalia the Householder replied, and the Blessed One said this. With the support of the non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned. So it was said a moment ago. <laughs> and with reference to what? Was that said? Here, a noble disciple considers thus. So a noble disciple thinks this way. I'm practicing the way to the abandoning and cutting off of those fetters because of which I might kill living beings. If I were to kill living beings, I would blame myself for doing so. The wise, having investigated, well, they would censure me for doing so. And on the dissolution of the body after death, because of killing living beings, an unhappy destination would be expected. But this killing of living beings is itself a fetter and a hindrance. And while taints, vexation, and fever might arise through the killing of living beings, there are no taints, there's no vexation, and there's no fever for one who abstains from killing living beings. So it is with reference to this, that I said, 
with the support of the non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned. So let's analyze that because it's going to be the same format for all eight in that way. <clears throat> so one of the ways that you could approach this sutta, it's sort of the way that I approached it or the way I thought of it initially. So Potalya hears these eight things, right? <clears throat> but then he says, mm, could you go into a little more detail about that? And one idea, for example, <clears throat> let's just take the first, the first of these. So this idea of not killing, it's kind of always a, a question, possibly, in the world of Buddhism, in terms of if I want to follow that precept, what exactly does it mean? Is it just um, what we would call homicide? Like, is it just humans? Is it all animals? Is it all the way down to, you know, when does it stop, right? So somebody like Potalia, upon hearing about not killing, when they ask for a more detailed explanation, they might be asking, or they might be thinking, well, what exactly do you mean by that? Like, where's the line? But I want us to notice the way that the Buddha answers that. And it's not, he's not giving a direct answer in terms of where the line is. He's actually explaining the very nature of killing living beings. And allow me to paraphrase it. He, what he says is that a noble disciple thinks, if I were to kill a living being, I would blame myself, first of all. Second of all, wise people like my peers, my the other monks, they would censure me, meaning they would punish me in some way. It would be against the rules. They, they don't think that it's a good thing for me to be doing that. So if I did it, A, I would blame myself, and B, others would blame me, and then C... <laughs> After death, I'm going to have a bad rebirth. So it's lose, lose, lose. <laughs> so the idea there is, right, is that the, the person thinks, but this killing of living beings is a fetter in that way. Whereas if I avoid killing living beings, I don't feel guilty in that way. Like, have you ever felt guilty about not killing? It sort of just alleviates the problem in that way. And if I avoid killing living beings, other people won't think badly of me. They won't censure me. <laughs> and if I avoid killing living beings, I could be reborn in a good destiny. Win, win, win. <laughs> So the idea here is, and then we get this idea of, well, it's it's coming later. But the idea here is, is that the, the noble disciple reflects upon the emotionality involved in the taking of life, in the killing of living beings, and recognizes that doing it is kind of fraught with all of these problems. <laughs> and not doing it doesn't have any problems. <laughs> so that's the reasoning involved in that. And I want you to notice now that it's sort of like no longer about what one is killing in that way. If that makes sense. Yeah, no. Well, I have a question about that. And then, and then I have a comment too that I wanted to say earlier, but um, so does that guidance though help one decide where, where that line is, like in line with what you were talking about earlier, you know, meaning it, it, it's sort of, it's not like an edict from, from above that, you know, 
you don't kill. And what we mean by that is this group of things. It's more like you don't kill. And what we mean by that is you find if it feels bad, then don't do it. Hmm. It's kind of like that. Kind of like that. Okay. It's, it's a little bit like that. I mean, I think, yeah, I think, you know, it's like it says in the sutta, it's about the, the noble disciple considering. Considering, yeah. Right, and thinking about this and and considering about how, again, kind of what I was saying, that it's about recognizing that the killing of living, living beings has all kinds of problems to it. Yeah. And not doing that, no problems. Yeah. And the noble disciple recognizes that. And now it's sort of, there is no line ever in that in that way, in that sense, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I noticed as you, as like a little after you first read the list of things that when Patalia first came to, first, a complaint to Gotama about it calling, being called a household lawyer. He says, I gave up all my wealth. Doesn't that make me a, a non-householder? But in but in in the Buddha's list, he I mean, he talks about greed, but he doesn't talk about giving up your wealth. So his the original item is not even in that list. Yep. He's not even addressing it. Yep. Ah, and there's going to be, Noam, you, you jogged my memory about something I wanted to mention. So there's a very subtle thing actually that we we may have already missed. And it, it's actually what, in a way, what's going on here. We want to remember that Potalia got angry when the Buddha was calling him a householder. And so that's one of the main hindrances, one of these main problems that Potalia is displaying. So he hasn't renounced anger. And that's what the Buddha is going to call him out on is in noble discipline, we renounce anger. You renounced having to deal with bills. Actually, that's what you renounced. <laughs> you you said, let my kids pay all the bills. I don't want to anymore. <laughs> so, all right. <clears throat> okay. So we... Because I'd like to get to the additional teachings in the sutta, I just want to mention this. So, of course, because of this is the Wisdom Publication Edition, you know, I want to make it clear that the Buddha then goes on to say, with the support of taking only what has been given, the taking of what is not been given is to be abandoned. That's what I said. And with reference, and so the whole thing should be repeated. And I want to do it one time, but we're not going to do it for all eight. But I do want you to recognize that it should be read this way. So he, the Buddha repeats what he said. And then, so it was said. And with reference to what was this said? Well, here a noble disciple considers thus. I'm practicing the way to the abandoning and cutting off of those fetters because of which I might take what has not been given. If I were to take what has not been given, I would blame myself for doing so. And the wise, having investigated, they would censure me for doing that. And on the dissolution of the body after death, because of taking what has not been given, an unhappy destination would be expected. But this taking what has not been given is itself a fetter and a hindrance. And while taints, vexation, and fever might arise through the taking of what has not been given, there are no taints, no vexation, no fever for one who abstains from taking what has not been given. So it is with reference to this that it was said with the support of not taking what has not been given, the taking of what has not been given is abandoned. Now, again, even though it's saying the same thing, this is about the noble disciple thinking about that 
and really thinking about each one of these. And so what I mean is, is that it's really about the noble disciple, the practitioner, reflecting on, if I were to go around stealing things, I wouldn't feel great about myself. I would blame myself. If others found out about it, they'd blame me. And in a future rebirth, it's going to be a bad one. Whereas if I don't do that, if I don't take what hasn't been given, there's no vexation, no fever, it's chill. <laughs> so that's the contemplation of the noble disciple. And they do that regarding the, you know, the problems involved with unkind speech, with, with malicious speech. But with the support of kind speech, with the support of unmalicious speech, malicious speech is abandoned. With the support of no rapacity and greed, rapacity and greed are abandoned. With the support of not being spiteful or scolding, spite and scolding are to be abandoned. With the support of no anger or irritation, and that's the big one that Patalia displayed, anger and irritation are to be abandoned. And the eighth one, with the support of non-arrogance or conceitedness, the I, I-ness, arrogance is to be abandoned. So it was said. And with reference to what was this said? Well, here, a noble practitioner considers thus. I'm practicing the way to the abandoning and cutting off of those fetters because of which I might be arrogant. If I were to be arrogant, I'd blame myself for this. The wise, having investigated, would censure me for this. And on the dissolution of the body after death, because of being arrogant, an unhappy destination would be expected. But this arrogance is itself a fetter and a hindrance. And while taints, vexation, and fever might arise through arrogance, there's no taints, no vexation, and no fever for one who is not arrogant. So it is with reference to this that it was said with the support of non-arrogance, arrogance is to be abandoned. These eight things that lead to the cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline have now been expounded in detail. But the cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline has not yet been achieved entirely and in all its ways. All right, so there's more to come, but any questions about how to approach contemplating those, those eight uh, dharmas there? Pretty straightforward, yeah. Um, by the way, in case I don't, yeah, in case I forget to mention it, one of the reasons why I, I, I like this sutra a lot, and I've taught this sutra in the past, and I really like this sutra for a bunch of reasons, and actually we haven't even gotten to why I really like it, but the one of the reasons why I really like it is because it's one of those it's one of those like early suttas that really sort of they they point to the kind of um and not all of them do this by the way but this is that kind of sutra that kind of almost eliminates the distinction between monastic and householder because the idea here is, is it, it's saying yeah don't be spiteful and to not be spiteful doesn't have anything to do with wearing robes and being a monk or having a job and a house. <laughs> and so if you actually look at these eight things that the Buddha talks about, they're achievable in that sense by everybody. And it's one of those sutras that's basically saying, yeah, this is the Dharma. Don't be a jerk. That's it. <laughs> so. I just wanted to kind of reinforce that as that. So now that we know the eight things that are cut off in the noble disciples discipline, and we know in detail 
why we would cut those off, like the logic involved, the wisdom involved in doing that, the Buddha says, so now I've expounded it in detail. So now you know, but that doesn't mean you've achieved it. Well, of course, now Patalya is very interested. So he says, Venerable Sir, how is the cutting off of affairs in the Noble One's discipline achieved entirely and in all ways? It would be good, Venerable Sir, if the Noble Bless or if the Blessed One would teach me the Dharma, showing me how the cutting off of affairs in the Noble One's discipline is achieved entirely and in all ways. Then listen, householder, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, Putalya the householder replied, and the blessed one said this. So, third teaching. Householder, suppose a dog, overcome by hunger and weakness, was waiting by a butcher shop. Then a skilled butcher or his apprentice would toss the dog a well-hacked, perfectly clean hacked skeleton of meatless bones smeared with a little blood. What do you think, householder? Would that dog get rid of its hunger and weakness by gnawing such a well-hacked, clean hacked skeleton of meatless bones smeared with a little blood? No, venerable sir. Why is that? Because that was a skeleton of well-hacked, clean-hacked, meatless bones smeared with blood. Eventually, that dog would reap weariness and disappointment. So too, householder. Noble disciples consider this way. They think this way. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a skeleton bone by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in sensual pleasures is great. Having seen this thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, they avoid the equanimity that is diversified based on diversity and they develop the equanimity that is unified based on unity, where clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. All right, we're going to pause there. So the Buddha is about to go into a series of similes. These series of similes that begin with the, the dog chewing on the on the bone these are you you find these in other suttas first of all so this is like stock a stock section of buddha buddha sutras in that way um i don't think i did the sutta that where a lot of these come from is earlier in this collection and i don't think i did it months ago when we were there so i want us to kind of there's a really important thing going on here. So, of course, there's the analogy or the simile about a dog trying to get satisfaction or actually trying to satisfy their hunger with just a bone, with nothing on it. They could chew and chew and chew, and they're not actually going to get satisfaction from the bone. And the Buddha says, yeah, that's like the world's sensual pleasures. You can chew and chew and chew and you won't get satisfaction. Now, that's a pretty straightforward teaching in that way. But what I want us to pay attention to and what I want to dive into is this end part. Oh, and by the way, the, the formula here that we're about to go through, it's the same formula for all the analogies. So that's why I, I just want to analyze this one. But I want to analyze this idea of Having seen as it actually is with proper wisdom, so having seen the situation as it is with proper wisdom, the noble disciple avoids the upeksha, 
avoids the equanimity that is diversified based on diversity and rather develops the upeksha or equanimity that is unified based on unity. And then where clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. So I'm going entirely off of Bhikkhu Bodhi and Bhikkhu Nyanamoli's a footnote on this one. They, of course, led me in the direction of researching the language involved here. And this is so interesting. It's, I've, I've, I actually, in a way, forget that I forgot that this was part of this sutra. So let's talk about Upeksha, which is being translated as equanimity, of course. But let's talk about what this means. Upeksha based on diversity versus Upeksha based on unity. So the first thing we need to talk about is the term Upeka in Pali or Upeksha in Sanskrit. So the term is almost always translated as equanimity. The problem with that, though, is that it doesn't exactly mean equanimity. And there's another Buddhist term that does mean equanimity. So the Buddhist term that does mean equal is the word samatha, very related to shamatha, but it's samatha. And it, it means sameness, total sameness. The term upeksha means relinquishment. But how do we get from relinquishment to equanimity? Well, the idea is, is that when I am not upekshik, if, if you will, when I'm not that way, I have preferences. When I haven't renounced or relinquished in that way, I want these, not those. But when I've relinquished, I, it, I, it's equal. And that's how you get to the equanimity, like translating upeksha as equanimity. They're jumping, Who, when we translate it as equanimity, we are jumping to the mind state of somebody who has relinquished. And such a mind state is equanimous in that sense. But the word upeksha literally means a kind of letting go or a relinquishing. And I wanted to reinforce that, like the kind of literal meaning of upekka or upeksha, because this idea of upeksha based on diversity versus upeksha based on unity. So the idea here is, and this is tricky. Try, I'm, right now, I'm trying to figure out how could I possibly describe this? Well, I think, yeah, I'll, I'll describe it this way. I'll, I'll ex actually, in an unexpected turn, I'm going to uh, I'm going to describe this or explain this with a personal anecdote. So when I was in my, er, I would say it was probably like my early 30s, so a while ago now, but when I was in my early 30s, I was definitely a, you know, a devoted practitioner in that way. I'd been studying Buddhism for a long time, been practicing, been teaching Buddhism, and it was sort of in my early 30s where I would say that I sort of, I went through kind of a period of depression in a way, I would say. Many people at that stage in life, it's kind of common in that sense. And I reached a certain point in that kind of depressive state where I didn't want anything. And when it happened to me that I was kind of done where I just didn't want anything in that way. It didn't feel super enlightened or equanimous. It felt 
sad and dark and depressed in that way. But I kept right thinking to myself, but isn't this it? Isn't this what like the Buddha was talking about? Like the non-desire, non-clinging. I was like, I'm not clinging. I don't want any of this. But there was something missing. And that feeling that I was having back then, I would describe as this kind of equanimity from diversity. And what the diversity means in this case, it means I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want you. I don't want that. I don't want that, 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 that. All of the different things, I don't want any of them. Versus a kind of wisdom that understands the equal nature of everything. That understands that at an ultimate level, everything is actually ultimately just a kind of word concept idea. And insofar as everything is just a word concept idea, they're all equal. There's no word that's better than another word. They all serve the function of words in that way. And that, a kind of equalizing of all dharmas, where it doesn't make sense for you to want this one over that one, because they're the same. That's a different feeling and a different sense of upeksha versus the, I don't want that one or that one or that one. That me, Meaning, I recognize that that one is different than that one. I don't want either of them. That is a different mentality than the mind that basically sees the equality of everything and then sees that there is no that it would be foolish to want this over that in that way. I'd like to say more about this, but any kind of anything come up from that? That idea of, uh, oh, thank you. Equanimity from diversity versus equanimity from unity. It's a, it's a, a subtle but huge difference, of course, in that way. Cool. So that's what I see going on here with this idea. Now, so this idea where it says, uh, with proper wisdom, the disciple, the practitioner, avoids the equanimity that's diversified based upon diversity, develops the upeksha that is unified, ekya, based upon unity, where clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. Just another, a quick little point on that last part, ceases without remainder. I want to remind you that that's a big part of the Buddhist um, project, is bringing all of these taints, these afflictions, kind of getting rid of them completely, without remainder. And I kind of just want to like, you know, highlight that idea that, you know, Buddhism is not promoting, and I know that you know this, I know I don't have to say this, but Buddhism is not promoting kind of repressing things and just trying to get them to be non-manifest. <laughs> They're actually going for complete elimination of what they call the root causes of these things. So I kind of, as we move forward with the sutta, I kind of want us to be looking at, or even just, you know, just be thinking about how the Buddha is getting at the root causes of these things, like what's really underneath all of them. So, okay. So with all of that in mind, let's read the next simile and see if it kind of jogs anything or, you know, gets us thinking any deeper. So, householder, Ganapati, suppose a vulture, a heron, or a hawk seized a piece of meat and flew away, and then vultures, herons, 
and hawks pursued it and pecked and clawed it. What do you think, householder? If that vulture or heron or hawk does not quickly let go of that piece of meat, wouldn't it incur death or deadly suffering because of that? Yes, venerable sir, Potalia replied. So too, householder, noble disciples consider thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a piece of meat by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Having seen thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, they avoid the equanimity that is diversified based on diversity and develop the equanimity that is unified based on unity. Where clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. So again, same format as the first one. The simile is different. Now it's about the, the vulture trying to hold on to this piece of meat while all these other vultures are pecking it to death. And if it doesn't let go of that piece of meat, those other vultures are going to destroy it. So we are like those that vulture holding on to our sensual pleasures. That's the analogy. This, this is a good one too. They're all good, but householder. Suppose a man took a blazing grass torch and went against the wind. <laughs> what do you think, householder? If that man does not quickly let go of that blazing grass torch, wouldn't that blazing grass torch burn his hand or his arm or some other part of his body so that he might incur death or deadly suffering because of that? Yes, venerable sir. So too, householder, noble disciples consider thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a grass torch by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Having seen this, thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, they avoid the equanimity of diversity based upon diversity and develop the equanimity that is unified based on unity. And clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. But wait, there's more. Householder, <laughs> suppose there were a charcoal pit deeper than a man's height full of glowing coals without any flame or smoke. And then a man came who, who wanted to live, not wanted to die, who wanted pleasure and recoiled from pain. But two strong men seized him by both arms and dragged him towards the charcoal pit. What do you think, householder? Would that man twist his body this way and that? Yes, venerable sir. And why is that? Because that man knows that if he falls into the charcoal pit, he will incur death or deadly suffering because of that. So too, householder. Noble disciples consider thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a charcoal pit by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Having seen this thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, they don't develop the, the equanimity based upon diversity, they develop the equanimity based on unity, where clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. Okay. Okay. Everybody doing okay? All right. So the next simile is in many ways for, for me, like the most important. And I want to kind of explain why that is. So the next simile is in many ways why I used to teach this sutra. And that's because as, as you know, if you've been coming to Dharma doors for a long time, you know that I, I personally am much more interested in Mahayana Buddhist sutras. Like I'm much more interested in Mahayana Buddhist philosophy and teachings and everything. 
But of course, if you can't understand the Mahayana without understanding these things. But I used to be more interested in like tracking down the Mahayana origins in the earlier suttas. And the next simile is like a, um, is a, con you know, it's a connective tissue with the Mahayana. And what it is, well, actually, let me read it and then we'll, then I'll explain sort of why I think it's so important. So the next simile he says is householder. Suppose a man dreamt about lovely parks, lovely groves, lovely meadows, and lovely lakes, and on waking, it was all gone. So too, householder, noble disciples consider thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a dream by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair while the danger in them is great. Having seen this thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, they don't develop the equanimity based upon diversity. They develop the equanimity based on unity, where clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. So in this analogy, the Buddha is comparing sensual pleasures to things seen in a dream. And this is where I think this is, I wanted to pause here I mean, this is really important because if you if you understand Buddhism or if you understand things one way, this means one thing. And what I mean by that is this. So the Buddha's talking about kama, right? Kama is is sensual pleasures. And they're talking, you know, kama sensual pleasures is, you know, seeing things pleasing to the eyes, hearing things pleasing to the ears, smelling pleasing things, eating pleasing foods, feeling pleasant things on the body, and thinking pleasant things with the mind. Those are sensual pleasures in that way. And when you read this about sensual pleasures being like uh, like a bone or like a piece of meat or like a charcoal pit, it can sound, of course, very austere in that sense of like renunciation and giving up the world and all of that. I, I can understand why that is. And the thing about it is, is that if you kind of just read it that way in terms of like, yeah, there's, there's, pleasures but just let them go that's not exactly what the buddha's teaching here and i think that becomes really clear with this one where he's saying and again this is alluding to other teachings where the buddha has said that sensual pleasures are like things in a dream and so the idea here is is that and this, of course, goes back to like classic Buddhist Dharma, Buddha Dharma. But what it is, is the Buddha is trying to point at how these things that we are calling sensual pleasures, they don't really exist to begin with. Like our understanding of them is faulty or wrong. It, and that's what, if we go back to the, the dog chewing on the bone, the dog doesn't understand that it's not going to get satisfaction from the bone. Yeah, it it tastes bloody, right? That's the interesting part about that uh, that simile is that the butcher smears a little bit of blood on the bone. So the dog is like convinced that there's got to be some nutrients there. But there's no nutrients there to be had. Likewise, we're sort of gnawing at these things of the world, trying to get a little pleasure out of them, but there's no pleasure to be had there. And this is where the idea is, is that the Buddha isn't really actually asking us to give up the pleasurable. The Buddha is asking us to give up the delusion of what we think is pleasurable. Two very different things. And what I mean is, is that one, 
you know, one is like a form of what would be called stoicism, like in a kind of true sense of that word, going back to like the kind of the stoic tradition in that way, where it's about a kind of like, like we, I can do this. And even though there's this, um, delightful, pleasing thing being dangled in my face, I have this self-control to not want it. That's not what's going on here. This is about the wisdom that is looking at the thing going like, yeah, you look pleasing, but you're ultimately not pleasing in that way. So I just want to emphasize that idea, especially this one about the dreamlike thing, because as we know, or as you may know, in the Mahayana tradition, every other line the Buddha is saying, and remember, all dharmas are like dreams. They're like bubbles, shadows, and illusions. So. All right, any questions about the dreamlike nature of reality? Anything like that? <laughs> hmm. No. Um. Well, I'm thinking about the example of the bird who has some meat and the other birds are chasing it, trying to, they're, they're, <laughs> and, I, and I'm thinking of that in terms of the, the equanimity being, uh, was what were the words, unified or? Uh, diversified. Diversified. Maybe this is not quite what he's saying, but it, it seems like, there's a that that bird has like a trade off, like keep trying to eat that meat or keep holding on to that meat and then get killed or let go of the meat. So it's almost like saying, you know, you, you got to see if it's worth it. And and by that, I don't mean that like. And, and that includes like the the the, the dreamlike part of it, it was like. Oh, I thought, you know, I'm I'm eating this thing that's, you know, really tastes good. Mm. Then I feel crappy afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like the, the delusion part of it, I mm -hmm. guess. Uh, I'm I'm trying to understand the diversified and unified, and that and that's oh, okay. So I'm I'm just thinking of it in terms of like. You know, if you get if you get something nice, it's okay to enjoy it. But if it gets taken away from you, also you should be okay with that. And so, the, so like the bird is like, oh, I have this great piece of meat. Mm. Yeah, the bird needs meat to eat, but not if it's going to cost him his life. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I hear you. My interpretation of that one, the that specific one about the vulture heron hawk with the with the piece of meat i would think of that one as um my feeling about that one i would relate it to something like um uh for me from personal experience years ago i would relate it to something like drinking alcohol and it's that idea of like this keeps making me sick which are the the things pecking at me yeah. But I'm going to keep holding on to this and keep trying, yeah. thinking that somewhere in there yeah. is pleasure. Yeah. And all the while I'm being pecked at by the ailments that it's causing. Yeah. And I, I would sort of look at it or I think of it that one that way. Yeah. But in terms of the important teaching here about avoiding the equanimity of diversity versus the equanimity of unity. I, I do, again, I want to stress that what I mentioned was a very like personal interpretation of that teaching from a, a personal experience of what I felt was relinquishment and equanimity, but I was sitting there feeling not enlightened, <laughs> not, I was still suffering, but was like, but how could there still be suffering, right? And that's, you know, there's, that's the problem with depression is there's so much kind of anger underneath it or desire because it's about, you know, the, the, you know, whatever, the love my parents didn't give me. And so I'm still wanting that. And it's like, yeah, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that. 
But if you look deeper, there's still a wanting, even though it might not be a material thing. So, um, so yeah, so I just wanted to acknowledge that that was my interpretation, but I think it's sort of, it fits in there somewhere. Cool. Well, let's keep going because there's a little bit more. Be great to finish the sutta. So uh, yet another analogy is the analogy of the borrowed goods. So householder, suppose somebody borrowed goods on a loan, maybe a, a, a fancy carriage, find jeweled earrings, and proceeded and surrounded by those borrowed goods, he went to the marketplace. Then people seeing him would say, Ooh, sirs, that's a rich man over there. That is how the rich enjoy their wealth. Then the owners, whenever they saw him, would take back their things. What do you think, householder? Would that be enough for that man to become dejected? Yes, venerable sir. And why is that? Because the owners took back their things. So too, householder, noble disciples consider thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to borrowed goods by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair while the danger in them is great. Having seen this thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, they avoid the equanimity based on diversity and they cultivate the equanimity based on unity and thus uh, the clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. And the last one, our... Yeah, I believe this is the last analogy. Householder. Suppose there was a dense grove not far from a village or town, within which there was a tree laden with fruit, but none of its fruit had fallen to the ground. Then a man came needing fruit, seeking fruit, wandering in search of fruit, and he entered the grove and saw the tree laden with fruit. Thereupon he thought, This tree is laden with fruit, but none of the fruit has fallen to the ground. I know how to climb a tree, so let me climb this tree, eat as much fruit as I want, and fill my bag. And he did so. Then a second man came needing fruit, seeking fruit, wandering in search of fruit, and taking a sharp axe. He too entered the grove and saw that tree laden with fruit. And then he thought, this tree is laden with fruit, but none of its fruit have fallen to the ground. I don't know how to climb, so let me cut the tree down, <clears throat> eat as much fruit as I want, and fill my bag. And he did so. What do you think, householder? If the first man who had climbed into the tree, if he doesn't come down quickly, when the tree falls, wouldn't he break his hand or his foot or some other part of his body so that he might incur death or deadly suffering because of that? Yes, venerable sir. So too, householder. Noble disciples consider thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to fruits on a tree by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Having seen this thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, they avoid the equanimity that is diversified based on diversity, and they develop the equanimity that is unified based on unity, where clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. And then the sutta <clears throat> kind of evolves into a, a full teaching, which we're not going to get into, but it goes on to say, and based upon that same supreme mindfulness, whose purity is due to the good equanimity, this noble disciple recalls manifold past lives, one birth, two births, and so on. And we've read the part about the recollection of past lives, right? And he understands all of his past lives and where he was born and so forth. 
And also, based upon that same supreme mindfulness whose purity is due to equanimity, by realizing for oneself with direct knowledge, the noble disciple here and now enters upon and abides in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. <clears throat> so we are cultivating even fuller. And at this point, householder, the cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline has been achieved entirely and in all ways. What do you think, householder? Do you see in yourself any cutting off of affairs like this cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline when it is achieved entirely and in all ways? Venerable sir, who am I that I should possess any cutting off of affairs entirely and in all ways like that in the noble one's discipline? I am far indeed, venerable sir, from that cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline when it has been achieved entirely and in all ways. <clears throat> For, venerable sir, though the wanderers of other sects are not thoroughbreds or are not all knowers, thoroughbred or all knower. So, Although there are wanderers of other sects who are not thoroughbreds, we imagined that they were thoroughbreds. Though they are not thoroughbreds, we fed them the food as though they were thoroughbreds. Though they are not thoroughbreds, we set them in the place of thoroughbreds. But though the bhikkhus are thoroughbreds, we imagine that they aren't thoroughbreds. Though they are thoroughbreds, we fed them the food of those who are not thoroughbreds. Though they are thoroughbreds, we set them in the place of those who are not thoroughbreds. And then all of that's going to get repeated in various ways <laughs> where basically we had it all wrong. We should have been honoring the Buddhists in that way. Venerable sir, the blessed one has inspired in me love for recluses confidence in recluses, reverence for recluses. Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent Master Gotama. Master Gotama has made the Dharma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been turned upside down, revealing what had been hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or hold, holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gautama for refuge and to the Dharma and the Sangha bhikkhus. From today, let Master Gautama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. <clears throat> All right. Any questions, comments, or ideas? Anything pop up? I, while I was reading, the other part of my mind was going and I was thinking, let's do another quick little um, example of diversified equanimity versus unified equanimity, since that sort of is a theme. So, what I thought of was a kind of a much simpler, clearer definition of that based on, again, based upon Bhikkhu Bodhi and Bhikkhu Nyanamoli's footnotes on this. But the idea here is in terms of like, <clears throat> I, I think the, the one way to, to grok it or think about it, it's sort of about thinking of a, a, a classic, classic example this is like a classic example that like a Thich Nhat Han would give. An example of, of equanimity or upeksha based on unity. An example of that, as I understand it, would be sort of the way that a parent loves all their children equally. 
And the point is, is that there's a, a kind of a, a unifying thread through that, which is, you know, perhaps the, the characteristic of being my children, if you will. But even though there's sort of that person or that child, that child and that child, there's this equanimous loving of them all versus a kind of, again, an equanimity that is still preserving this diversity in that way. And it's kind of affirming a kind of difference and then kind of saying, but, but I, I'm cool with either of them, which is different. That kind of like acceptance of these two things preserving their diversity versus the mind or the wisdom that can dig down to the unifying factor under both of them and then have this upeksha or equanimity, but from the unity between them, not an upeksha that's preserving their diversity in that way. Again, not always the best examples, but you know, I feel like we have a maybe a a feeling for this one, hopefully. So, any questions, comments about the conclusion or anything that's? Yeah, Maria. Oh. <laughs> All right, Maria, then Robin. There, there we so. go. Um, <clears throat> just um, wondering if I'm on the right track um, that uh, equanimity that comes from unity is arising from uh, wisdom around non the non-dual nature of reality or prana wisdom. Yes? Yep. And okay, it could good. be a lot of things in, in the way that you were going, Maria. There's like emptiness as an equalizer, no self mm -hmm. as an equalizer. Mm -hmm. Many, many teachings kind of equalize all dharmas in that way. That is the, gotcha. is the good way sense. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Robin, do you have a comment or a question or idea? Uh, when they, yes, thank you. They were talking, I uh, said, clinging to the material utterly ceases. And so the, the clinging action, um, what, what action then is, you know, do we replace clinging with, or is it just become, or, you know what I mean? I do. So really important kind of quick teaching here. So clinging, what the word that is being translated as clinging and the idea is what is called upadana. And upadana, if you wanted to really technically translate it, I think a really good technical translation of upadana is appropriation appropriating. And I always give this example of appropriating, which is to say clinging or grasping in that way. And a really quick way to think about this, it's the idea of ownership. What I mean by that is upadana is the idea that this is my cup that like I own it. So that's the clinging is the sense of ownership. So we wanna notice that it can look like, you know, physical clinging, but we're more interested in the mental clinging, which is the notion that it's mine, that I own it. And what I kind of, I always use this as an example and it's, so this is my cup, like I own it. Now watch. <laughs> okay, now I relinquish the cup. I don't own it anymore. C come and get it. It's yours if you want it. 
So it's it's not mine anymore. I'm not appropriating it. I don't think I own it anymore. Cheers. Notice that nothing changed, but something radically changed here. And it was this idea that I owned it. Now, the now the 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 detailed teaching. What happens when I own my cup, like I'm appropriating it and it's mine? If somebody comes and runs away with it, ah, I'm going to be all upset. But if I relinquish ownership of the cup and I don't think I own it anymore, and somebody comes and runs away with it, I think, oh, they must have needed a cup. It was not my cup. So in answer to your question, Robin, like appropriating or upadana is this delusion of ownership. What's the opposite of that? <laughs> not doing, not doing that, right? But I want to remind everybody, though, in terms of my example, ownership, that kind of clinging ownership, it's a delusion. We don't actually own anything. It's, it's why we have courts and like police and things. It's because we don't actually own anything. And so what that means is, is that because I don't actually own anything, we have to go battle it out in a legal system. If I really owned it, there would be no way for you to take it. There, it, would, it would be, there, if you see what I'm getting at. So ownership is just sort of what I would call a disposition. We have a disposition towards the world we have a disposition towards ourselves in that way. And that disposition is one of upadana, clinginess. And the, what the Buddha talks about, of course, is the I and the possessions of I. So that sense of self is being kind of fabricated from all the upadana-ing, if you will, from all the appropriating. But again, what I want us to remember is, is that the idea of like, ooh, my cup, my computer, these are all just opinions <laughs> in, that, in that sense. And those opinions can get rather rigid and then lead to suffering because, no, I really did own it. Whereas if we're a little looser about the, our ideas of ownership, which is like, well, maybe I don't actually own it. Maybe it just happens to be in my vicinity right now. So I hope that helps with that idea of clinging versus not clinging. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. Then another sutta has been completed. Wonderful. There you go. That concludes the Patalya Sutta. Um, we will move on to a new sutra next week. That's for sure. So stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, Maria. I just have a quick curiosity um, around uh, that came up when we were talking about the, the fruit tree stuff. Um, if a monk was out on, say, alms round, and they came upon a fruit tree, was it appropriate for them to eat fruit mm -hmm. that wasn't, that, you know, could they stand under a tree and let it fall in the bowl? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, how, do, how does that work? That's a really good question. My understanding of it and this is based on both on talking to monastics and from my um, my master's degree was in the Vinaya or the Vinaya. So I had to study a lot of the minutia. And my understanding of it is that gleaned or fallen fruit 
it ha is considered to have been offered, but picking fruit is considered taking what has not been given yet. So, Got it. yeah, that makes sense. it does make sense. Um, but in general, of course, the, the begging bowl, you know, was sort of a vital part of the, it is a vital part of the monastics world because they originally were only supposed to eat what was put in the bowl. And yeah, at that point you would have to wait under the tree in that sense. But, but I remember reading a minor rule where, where fallen fruit was acceptable. So yeah. All right, everybody, we'll call it a night there and we'll be back next Sunday.